good afternoon everybody our today's session is about to begin now i would like to invite professor dr hori prasad sarkar principal of gorbeta college and the chief patron of this program to deliver today's welcome speech sir please okay am i am i audible yes, am i audible sir. clear yes sir yes okay. sir good afternoon good afternoon everybody welcome to all on the second day of the of our webinar entitled engagement program for students and teachers first phase on linear algebra analysis and differential equation organized by the department of mathematics for the college and i had to welcome today's speaker dr saurabh das assistant professor department of mathematics national institute of technology jamshedpur and also dr vikas chakraborty who will also speak today assistant professor department of mathematics jamshedpur university central college gohada and thank you all uh, thank you all uh, the organizers for arranging that type of seminar today's seminar the engagement program for the students and teachers yesterday we have an eminent speaker professor sujit kumar sarkar sarkar professor department of mathematics mathematics jagatpur university and yesterday program also was very much successful with a long discussion uh, by this eminent speaker dr sujit kumar sarkar nearly out more than 3 hours and uh, i thank uh, to him for his uh, lecture and like yesterday i think today's program will be highly successful and after all all the participants will be highly benefited from their lecture by the dr saurabh das and dr dipak sakuri and and uh, it is about my introduction and welcome at this to the speaker and all the participants in the today's webinar thank you all sir thank you for your speech am i audible <laughs> sir thank yes. you for your speech and uh, i convey my heartfelt gratitude to you for being with us throughout this program and continuously inspiring us as mentioned by our principal sir today we have the privilege to have two eminent mathematicians dr shourav dash and dr bikash chakraborty among us as the distinguished speakers Now I would like to introduce Dr. Shourav Das, the first speaker of today's session. Research interests of Dr. Shourav Das includes complex analysis, orthogonal polynomials, and special functions. He has received his B.Sc. in Mathematics degree from University of Kalyani, and he has received M.Sc. and Ph.D. degree in Mathematics from IIT Roorkee. After that, he joined. National Institute of Technology Hamirpur as a lecturer in the year 2017 then he joined National Institute of Technology Jamshedpur as an assistant professor in the year 2018 he has published several research articles in various reputed international and national journals and delivered talks in international conferences in India as well as outside India like London Austria Malaysia He has also delivered several expert lectures in various workshops, short-term faculty development courses, and webinars. He has received best publication of the year 2017 by the Society for Special Functions and their applications. He is also editor of Paris Journal of Mathematical Sciences. He is reviewer of various international journals like Ramanujan Journal, Indian Journal of Pure and Applied Mathematics. advances in difference equations and mathematical reviews he is also a member of american mathematical society society for special functions and their applications and found, and foundations of computational mathematics the title of his today's talk is orthogonal polynomials and applications now i would like to invite dr chorak das to deliver his speech so please okay thank you professor rajesh sri uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, the organizers the chief patron dr haripada sarkar principal of garveta college and uh, the coordinator uh, pritish kumar and uh, 
Special thanks to the conveners, Dr. Abhijit Banerji and Dr. Rajalakshmi uh, Mukherjee for their day and night efforts for this uh, uh, event. And I would also like to thank the head of the department, Mathematics, for this event. So I'll, today I'm going to discuss about uh, orthogonal polynomials and applications. I'll just uh, share the slides. Just a second. Uh, okay. Are the slides visible? Hmm. Visible. Yeah, it's quite clear. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes. audible? So, today we are going to discuss about orthogonal polynomials and applications. The pioneer of orthogonality, uh, this is the photo of Chebyshev, and if you open any book of orthogonal polynomials or Basic undergraduate book, first polynomial we can see is the Chebyshev polynomial. It's a common, and we can see different kind of spelling, like that Chebyshev, Chebyshev, like that, but all are correct. Actually, orthogonality of functions were initially defined by Murphy in 1835. Later, Chebyshev realized their importance and his work since 1855 was motivated by the analogy with Fourier series and by the theory of continued fractions and approximation theory. We will discuss all these things uh, in a later stage and how orthogonal polynomials are important and how orthogonal polynomial play vital role in approximation theory and theory of continued fractions and, and our real life problems. So first of all, let us discuss about why should one study orthogonal polynomial? Why should we know about orthogonal polynomials? So answer is not uh, simple, means uh, there are so many answers available, but first answer, I would like, uh, since uh, so many undergraduates, graduates, and other uh, students are there and, uh, and other members are there, so I started this answer with a simple theorem, what is this approximation theorem? This is very famous theorem. This theorem says that any continuous function on a closed and bounded interval can be uniformly approximated on that interval by a polynomial to any degree of accuracy. Let us simplify the thing. For example, suppose fx is any continuous function in a closed interval ab and obviously f is real valued and then there exists a polynomial Px such that mod of Fx minus Px is less than epsilon. That means if we have a continuous function, we can all in a, in a closed interval AB, then we can always approximate it by a polynomial. Now, someone can ask me a question, okay, Px is any polynomial, then why should you discuss about orthogonal polynomial? 
since we are talking about approximation here so definitely error comes into the picture whenever you are approximating on function by polynomial some error will come so instead of any arbitrary polynomial if we use orthogonal polynomial we will get less error now we move towards the importance orthogonal polynomials are important as very uh, uh, has so many applications in approximation theory theory of numerical quadrature minimizing the error caused by inter interpolation and mathematical physics and different branches of science and engineering but one thing we should keep in our mind that when we use orthogonal polynomial for approximation so rather than just power of x it is necessary to use higher degree polynomial so to get the better approximation and to get less error so let us first define orthogonal polynomial so suppose that we have a polynomial sequence of polynomials p and x and it satisfies this orthogonality property a to b wx pnx pmx dx is equal to kn delta nm where kn is positive here delta nm is the kronecker delta and here the notation pn pm is the inner product so if this inner product satisfies this property we call this is ortho this sequence of polynomial pnx is orthogonal with respect to the weight function wx if you are familiar with measure then we can exclude this weight function and instead of writing dx someone can write pnx pmx d mu x is equal to kn delta nm where mu is positive measure and if mu is absolutely continuous then d mu x can be expressed as wx dx so both are equivalent definition for for our simplicity we are just taking wx as weight function so before going for different kind of polynomials let us characterize orthogonal polynomials so what an orthogonal polynomial can be characterized in two parts or two ways classical and non classical classical polynomials also can be separated in two parts or it can be discussed in two ways one is infinite another is finite now you can now someone can think that why infinite comes into the picture because whenever you are talking about polynomials that means it has a fixed degree n so for example x to the power n plus something uh, uh, plus a on x to the power n minus n minus 1 and so on but you don't think in that way here infinite and finite what is the difference between infinite and finite we'll discuss later it depends on the orthogonality relation we'll discuss it later and classical orthogonal polynomial okay we discussed about infinite and finite and infinite polynomials has three different kind of uh, three uh, uh, three members jacobi lagarde and hermite some people is to call hermit and finite class of orthogonal polynomials classical orthogonal polynomials has members called romanovsky or romanovsky polynomials romanovsky polynomials again has three parts first class second class and third class and it is also known as r jacobi r lagarde r hermite r stands for romanovsky similar way non classical orthogonal polynomials has two parts quantum and discrete polynomial so in this uh, uh, talk today we'll discuss mostly about classical orthogonal polynomials or hypergeometric orthogonal polynomials again jacobi polynomials has some particular cases and mostly when we see some books we find this kind of polynomials legendre polynomial 
Chebyshev polynomials, ultraspherical polynomials, Gegenbauer polynomials. So most of the books in the graduates, undergraduate books, I saw things like Chebyshev polynomials, these are common. So how can you get this kind of polynomials? So Jacobi polynomials are denoted by P and alpha beta x. So if you put alpha is equal to beta is equal to zero, Jacobi polynomial will imply or reduces to Legendre polynomial. If you put alpha is equal to beta, then it will become ultraspherical polynomial. If you put alpha is equal to beta is equal to lambda minus half, then it will give you a Gegenbauer polynomial. And similarly for alpha is equal to beta is equal to minus half, we get Chebyshev polynomial of first kind. And generally Chebyshev polynomial of first kind are known as Chebyshev polynomials. And alpha is equal to beta is equal to plus half, we get Chebyshev polynomial of second kind. So these are some uh, uh, family of classical orthogonal polynomials. So another name of classical orthogonal polynomial is hypergeometric orthogonal polynomial. Why people call it is it as hypergeometric orthogonal polynomial? Because any classical orthogonal polynomial can be expressed in terms of hypergeometric functions. So what is hypergeometric function? Let us see first, because to discuss about orthogonal polynomials or classical orthogonal polynomials, we need the help of hypergeometric functions. So, hypergeometric function, before going for general hypergeometric function, let us first discuss about Gaussian hypergeometric function. So, oh, it's obvious that it was uh, given by, provided by Gauss. This is a photo of Gauss. So, let us consider Gaussian hypergeometric differential equation. And we can see that it's a second order linear differential equation and it has three regular singular points, zero, one, and infinity. And since it is second order differential equation, we have two independent solutions, a linearly independent solution. So how to solve this hypergeometric equation? So this is a differential equation with variable coefficients. And on simple method is to apply Frobenius method, or you can say series solution. So here you can see that x is equal to zero is, a, is an ordinary point. And if you solve it using Frobenius method, you can, we can find the series solution like that, provided c not equal to zero and negative integers. So for c non zero and non-negative integers, a solution of this uh, Gaussian hypergeometric differential equation can be obtained like that. Here we have used on symbol alpha n, this is known as Pokamer symbol. Here, alpha naught is equal to one and alpha n is equal to alpha, alpha plus one, alpha two, plus two, and alpha plus n minus one. And if you see it in a deeper way, if you zoom it, you can see that it is nothing but your related to factorial n. Put alpha is equal to one here in the last, uh, in this, then you can see that it is giving us factorial n. So Pokamar symbol generalizes the concept of factorial and alpha n can be expressed also in terms of the ratio of gamma function. Here we can see that alpha n is equal to ratio of gamma alpha plus n and gamma alpha. One thing we should keep in our mind that alpha should not be negative integer and zero. Why? because gamma function is not defined for zero and negative integers. So why the name hypergeometric? Because here you can see the red mark, the coefficient red here, a k, b k by factorial k, c k. Actually, it generalizes the geometric series. If we put alpha is equal to one and beta is equal to b, gamma is equal to b, so you can see here like this, one k, b k, b k factorial k. So one k, tokamar of one k is nothing but factorial k. 
So ultimately, we will get geometric series. So geometric series is a particular case of hypergeometric series. That's why that series is known as hypergeometric because it generalizes geometric series. And this hypergeometric series has uh, to a form has integral representation of this form. Now, next question is that can we generalize this hypergeometric series? So it's true, and uh, a generalized form of hypergeometric function can be expressed like that. So initially, what we did in terms of in, in the in the form of Gaussian hypergeometric series. So Gaussian hypergeometric series, we had a k, b k in the numerator and c k in the denominator. So if you take m times a one. A2 and uh, AM and here uh, in the numerator uh, N times, then uh, we can get a generalized version of Gaussian hypergeometric series. We call it generalized hypergeometric series. Now, one another important question here is that after solving, we are getting this, uh, after solving this Gaussian hypergeometric equation using Frobenius method, we are getting this one kind of solution. What is the guarantee that this series will converge? Because if it is diverges, then it has of no use. We need convergence. So similar way, so we will discuss the convergence of uh, Gaussian hypergeometric series or function. So you can check the convergency of the series using ratio test or comparison test. So if you, if, so for example, Initially, we take two f one that is Gaussian hypergeometric series. So, if we take the ratio, uh, if we just take the limit and you apply the ratio test, and we just get the value mod z. So, using ratio test, you can see that if mod z less than one, then the series converges. Similar way, but this test fails when mod z is equal to one. So, test fails, ratio test fails. So, for mod z is equal to one, we can apply any other test. And if you consider delta is equal to real part of C minus A minus B, and that should be greater than zero. And if you compare these two series, and for mod J equal to one, using this comparison test, we get zero, it's less than one. So finally, if A, B, C are neither zero or negative integer, then 2F1 is convergent in the unit disk mod J less than one. If either or both of AB is zero or a negative integer, then the series terminates and the convergence does not enter in the discussion. And if real part of C minus A minus B is positive, then Gaussian hypergeometric series is absolutely convergent on the boundary of the circle. So now what about the convergence of general hypergeometric series or general hypergeometric function. So here we have M and N, uh, M, M parameters in the numerator and N parameters in the denominator. So if M is less equal to N, then the series converges for all finite Z. And if Z is equal to, if M is equal to N plus one, then the series converges inside the disk, in a disk and diverges for mod z get outside the unit disk. Now, what is the importance of this hypergeometric series? Most of the well-known orthogonal polynomials and special functions can be expressed in terms of this hypergeometric series or hypergeometric functions. Let us see, let us have a look. For example, exponential function, e to the power z. E to the power z can be expressed as on f1 on one z. Similar way, our other trigonometric functions like cos cosine z, sine z can also be expressed in terms of hypergeometric function. Similar way, if you take a finite uh, one minus z to the power a, then it can also be expressed in terms of hypergeometric function. So there are several things, 
and if we can express in terms of hypergeometric function already we know the convergence criteria of hypergeometric function so that we can easily check the convergence criteria of other functions if it can be expressed in terms of hypergeometric function now let us come to our main uh, topic that is orthogonal polynomials so orthogonal polynomials has some special properties first of all orthogonal polynomials can be obtained by applying grams need orthogonalization process we can uh, we know about grams need orthogonalization process it is well known procedure to construct orthogonal uh, uh, polynomials or function uh, another property is that the orthogonal polynomial of a fixed degree is unique up to a scaling and a polynomial for p not equal to non zero polynomial is an orthogonal polynomial if and only the inner product is zero for any polynomial q with degree q less than p and this last property can be easily seen from the definition and a polynomial non zero polynomial is orthogonal polynomial if and only p inner product of p and x to the power k is zero for any k non zero k uh, any k of degree less than p so orthogonal polynomial satisfies on interesting property called uh, three term recurrence relation so if we have any orthogonal polynomial then it must satisfy three term recurrence relation and vice versa if we can find a polynomial that satisfies this three term recurrence relation we can say that it is orthogonal with respect to some weight function in an interval a so there are some properties of zeros of orthogonal polynomials so zeros of orthogonal polynomial p n are real and distinct so for n degree polynomial we have n simple zeros and it should be noted that there is no common zero between pnx and pn minus 1 last property is known as interlacing property between any two zeros of a polynomial orthogonal polynomial pnx there exist exactly one zero of pn minus 1 let us see this with some graphics so if pnx is a sequence of orthogonal polynomials on an interval ab with respect to the weight function wx then the polynomial pnx has exactly n real simple zeros in ab you can see in this diagram so here we have plotted a uh, 7 degree polynomial you can see that the seven zeros are lying inside the inside the interval ab so this polynomial actually orthogonal in the uh, interval ab with respect to some weight function w so interlacing of zeros so if pn is a sequence of orthogonal polynomial on ab with respect to the weight function wx then the zeros of pnx and pn plus 1 separate each other that means you can see we have two colors here one uh, is a uh, one is in green another is in red so we can see that between two green points there is exactly one red point so actually what happened here we have checked the orthogonality uh, interlacing property of six degree polynomial so suppose this is a six degree polynomial has six zeros so these six zeros are plotted here and here five zeros so we can see that uh, between two zeros of 6 degree polynomial exactly five uh, exactly one uh, zero of 5 uh, degree polynomial is there so this property is known as interlacing of zeros of orth orthogonal polynomials so now we'll discuss about classical orthogonal polynomials so to discuss about classical orthogonal polynomials so let us consider the second order linear differential equation so this differential equation actually is known as sturm lively differential equation here 
sigma x is at most quadratic tau x is at most linear so where sigma x is actually that's why i wrote it as ax square plus bx plus c e at most quadratic and tau x is linear that is gx plus e are polynomials and independent of n and lambda n is equal to n into n minus 1 a plus n d and lambda n is known as the eigen value parameter which depends on n and a b c d e are real parameters so in the self adjoint form of this differential equation the general weight function is given by wx is equal to e to the power integral over dx plus e by ax square plus bx plus c with respect to dx so these the parameters d and e in equation 2 depend on three independent parameters a b c so the parameters d and e into depend on the three independent parameters a b and c so automatically we will have exactly six solutions of equation 1 and the so here we have three parameters here we have two parameters and this two depend on three so we have six solutions so we will have exactly six solution of the differential equation 1 and i told already that this differential is equation is known as term level differential equation and the six solution are known as classical orthogonal polynomials and this classical orthogonal polynomials first and first three classical orthogonal polynomials are jacobi lagrange and hermite you can see the photos of jacobi lagrange and hermite respectively so we have a table here that depending on the value of sigma x we and tau x and the weight function we have the ortho corresponding orthogonal polynomial and these polynomials are nothing but the solutions of this stam lively differential equation using frobenius method so we can see that jacobi for jacobi polynomial sigma x is is equal to 1 minus x square and lagrange is x and hermite is 1 so these are mainly well known jacobi lagrange hermite are well known classical orthogonal polynomials later on romanowski defined another three classes of orthogonal polynomials that is known as romanowski polynomials and you can see that r jacobi r hermite and r lagrange here with this with where sigma x is x into 1 minus x and and so on but there are alternative names for romanowski polynomials these polynomials are known as finite class of orthogonal polynomials now question is that initially when we saw the tree of orthogonal polynomials we saw that classical orthogonal polynomials has two parts that one is finite another is infinite so in finite case we are saying it is jacobi lagrange hermite and finite case we are saying that first class second class third class but question is that why are we calling this as finite also because you can see here for infinite class of classical orthogonal polynomial there is no restriction on the degree of polynomial you can see here weight uh, this jacobi lagrange and hermite are orthogonal with respect to weight function but here there is no restriction on n but for the case of finite class that r jacobi r lagrange and r hermite we can see that p greater than 2 into maximum of n plus 1 that means n is bounded above same thing holds for second class also here we can see that n has upper bound because p and q are fixed so for the case of first class second class or third class orthogonality relation will be satisfied only up to a finite sequence finite terms or finite degree after finite degree orthogonality property will not be satisfied so although we have infinite collection of sequence of polynomials pnx for infinite case 
uh, it will satisfy orthogonality property will satisfy for all n but for finite class of orthogonal polynomials that is uh, first class second class and third class orthogonality relation will be satisfied only up to a fixed degree after that the orthogonality property will not be satisfied it will be just a polynomial so that's why it is known as finite class of orthogonal polynomials so correct some correct character, uh, characterization of classical orthogonal polynomials so orthogonal polynomials satisfies some properties and these properties are common to all the orthogonal polynomials so if pn is a an orthogonal polynomial or pn is a class of orthogonal polynomial then its derivative is also an orthogonal polynomial and it has very wide application the derivative uh, we'll discuss uh, in our uh, in this uh, talk up, uh, in a later stage regarding the derivative of orthogonal polynomial so another property common property we have already seen that after we are getting uh, classical orthogonal polynomial after solving the stam liability differential equation so every classical orthogonal polynomial satisfies stam liability differential equation and here ax is at most quadratic bx at most linear and every classical orthogonal polynomial satisfies rodrigues formula and derivative of classical orthogonal polynomials are also classical orthogonal polynomials so there are some remark that any system of orthogonal polynomials having the above first three properties can be reduced to a system of classical orthogonal polynomials so we have considered the ortho uh, stam liability differential equation so these are general dirich uh, general uh, boundary condition for stam liability differential equation so one can use the dirichlet condition or neumann condition for this stam liability differential equation so jacobi like polynomials or r jacobi polynomials for the case of this polynomial uh, a is actually quadratic b is linear and a has two distinct real roots the roots of a lies strictly between the roots of uh, a and the leading terms of a are between have the same sign so there are some characteristics i'm just skipping this so sl stands for stam liability so the characteristic of stam liability differential equation so the interval of orthogonality is bounded by whatever root ax has and the root of bx is inside the interval of orthogonality now question is that how to get the suppose we know on stam liability differential equation now question is that uh, can we get uh, can we get uh, a weight function for an orthogonal polynomial yes answer is yes that suppose that rx is equal to e to the power integral over bx upon ax then the then the polynomials pn are orthogonal under the weight function w is equal to rx upon x so if we know the stam liability differential equation from there we can get the corresponding weight function for the orthogonal polynomial and the this weight function has certain properties that weight function wx has no zeros or infinities inside the interval though it may have zeros or infinities at the end points and wx gives a finite inner product to any polynomial another property is that weight function can be made to be greater than 0 in the interval negative enter the uh, differential equation in case so that ax greater than 0 inside the interval now we discuss about the about some special orthogonal polynomials first we consider like jacobi polynomial so this uh, this is called jacob jacobi and jacob is uh, mainly known for jacobi polynomial jacobi fun elective function jacobi simple and jacobi operator so jacobi polynomials are hypergeometric polynomials or classical polynomials because these polynomials can be expressed in terms of hypergeometric functions so 
Jacobi polynomials are orthogonal with respect to the weight function uh, 1 minus x to the power alpha and 1 plus x to the power beta in the interval minus 1 plus 1. And if this is a standard notation for Jacobi polynomial, that's P and alpha beta, the standard notation. And Jacobi polynomial satisfies this differential equation. So if we solve this differential equation using Frobenius method, we get Jacobi polynomial. And we can express Jacobi polynomial in terms of hypergeometric uh, function also or Gaussian hypergeometric function. <coughs> but one point should be noted here regarding the convergence of this hypergeometric expression. Because we, can, you, we have already proved that if we have a Gaussian hypergeometric series, then it will converge if mod z is less than 1. So in, in the place of mod z, we have 1 minus mod z by 2. So this will converge if mod of 1 minus z upon 2 less than 1. So this expression is valid inside the analysis 1 less than mod z less than 3. So this is uh, the expression of Jacobi polynomial in terms of hypergeometric function. And Generally, a hypergeometric function is an infinite series, but you keep in mind that first parameter is minus n. So whenever you are putting negative integer after certain, after certain parameters or after certain terms, the remaining terms will vanish. So that's why it will, from the infinite series, it will, it will be converted into a polynomial. So this expression is valid inside the analysis. So, there is an alternative expression of this Jacobi polynomial. This can be, so ultimately when you solve this differential equation, you will get a solution like this. So this is another alternative uh, uh, representation of this Jacobi polynomial, and this is a special case. So Jacobi polynomial satisfies this orthogonality relation. We can see here, weight function is there, and interval of orthogonality is minus one plus one. But keep it in mind that alpha and beta should be greater than minus one. Otherwise, this orthogonality relation will not be satisfied. So there is a there's symmetrical relation that P and alpha beta X is equal to P and beta alpha minus X. This is called symmetry. And P and beta alpha minus one is equal to minus one to the power n, n plus one C n. So this is called derivative formula. So if we find the kth order derivative of Jacobi polynomial, then we'll get like, then we get this recurrence relation. Now, one special property of orthogonal, uh, classical orthogonal polynomial is that it satisfies three term recurrence relation. And it is due to the Favart's theorem we have already discussed. It has a huge application and wide application, we'll discuss it. So Jacobi polynomial satisfies this three term reconciliation. And this is the graph of Jacobi polynomial. It's a, for a particular parameter and particular case, P and alpha beta. Actually by mistake, I wrote uh, on uh, five, uh, just in the uh, prefix. So this is a five degree polynomial with alpha is equal to minus half and beta is equal to minus half. So we can, you can uh, see that the zeros lies between, uh, you can see here five zeros, one, two, three, four, five, and all the zeros lies between, uh, lies in the interval minus one plus one. And this is the, classical theorem of interlacing property, the zeros of Pn, where Pn is an orthogonal polynomial over the interval AB, are real and distinct and lie over the interval AB. That actually we saw. Whatever zero that n degree polynomial has, it will lie inside the interval minus one plus one. Now, 
this is nothing but interlacing properties so this is uh, this is a zeros for n degree polynomial this is zero for n minus 1 degree polynomial then it will satisfy interlacing property and this is called monotonicity property so if alpha greater than minus 1 beta greater than minus 1 and the xk are the zeros of pn alpha beta jacobi polynomial then derivative of xk with respect to alpha is less than zero and derivative with respect to beta is greater than zero for each k now another different kind of interlacing property of jacobi polynomial so this is a, i'm just uh, disc uh, discussing it that uh, if alpha greater than minus 1 and beta greater than minus 1 and t between uh, lies between 0 and 2 then uh, with these properties uh, then minus 1 uh, then between minus 1 and plus 1 this kind of interlacing property will be satisfied but my i have a question here that will all the time or all the uh, cases if we consider uh, if we if we consider all the cases for the parameter uh, then uh, will uh, that uh, interlacing property be satisfied so we'll discuss uh, regarding that so here we can see that interlacing property fails so why interlacing property fails here because you can see that we have just changed the parameter here we have uh, P uh, Jacobi polynomial Pn with parameter alpha beta and here n minus 1 degree polynomial with parameter alpha plus 2.1. I have just changed the parameter and I kept all other things same. Then we can see that here for 4 degree Jacobi polynomial there are 4 roots and for 3 degree Jacobi polynomial there are 3 roots but we cannot find one root exactly between two roots of four degree Jacobi polynomial. So if we change the parameters of Jacobi polynomial, then interlacing property may not be satisfied. So for satisfying interlacing property, Jacobi uh, alpha and beta must satisfy certain properties and this can be found in these results. So here interlacing property fails. So similar way, different kinds of uh, results are available like uh, zeros uh, regarding the interlacing of zeros of Jacobi polynomials. So, one another property is that when the zeros are interlacing, they are also monotone. But the converse, what about the converse? So, therefore, the properties hold for the zeros uh, of Pn alpha beta and Pn alpha plus k. But we note that if we take n is equal to 4 and this different kind of parameters, then the uh, Jacobi polynomials, uh, this uh, Jacobi polynomial has these four zeros, uh, while this has, uh, this also has four zeros, but here these uh, polynomials uh, satisfy uh, zeros, uh, satisfy monotonicity property, but they do not interlace. So I'm just skipping these things uh, because we have discussed a lot about uh, this uh, monotonicity and uh, interlacing. Let us consider another polynomial. This is a very famous polynomial and it has very wide application in non-linear optimization. So if we take alpha is equal to beta is equal to minus half in Jacobi polynomial, uh, then Jacobi polynomial will reduce to Chebyshev polynomial. Some people used to write T uh, also in the spelling of Chebyshev. We are just writing it in Chebyshev. So Chebyshev polynomial can be defined like this. And this satisfies these three term reconciliations. And this, this is the graph of Chebyshev polynomial. I have just used a different notation Tn. This is the standard notation actually for uh, Chebyshev uh, Tn. Since we are using this spelling Chebyshev, that's why it is Tn here. And you can see that here you have used this spelling CHE. That's why we have used C notation C. So it depends. So this is the graph of Chebyshev polynomial. So according to the property of orthogonal polynomial, we can see that the, all the zeros lies between minus one and the plus one in the open interval. And this polynomial satisfies interlacing property. For example, you take n is equal to one. So this is that 45 degree angle, this line. And if you take n is equal to two, we have, uh, we have, uh, which one? Uh, this polynomial. Uh, this is my mouse pointer. 
minutes. So we can see that exactly one zeros between the. Otherwise, you just take n is equal to two and three, so it will be visible for you. N is equal to two and three, so you can easily check that between two consecutive zeros of higher degree polynomial, exactly on zeros of lower degree polynomial exist. So these are some properties of Chebyshev uh, polynomials, and this is the uh, orthogonality relation of Chebyshev polynomial. Uh, this is the main thing. That's why Chebyshev polynomials is famous. Chebyshev poly Chebyshev polynomial uh, are useful for non-linear optimization problem. So this is known as mi uh, mi uh, minimax problem. So if you solve this problem, uh, this uh, problem, uh, the solution of this problem can be expressed in terms of Chebyshev polynomial. So when people uh, Once uh, least error in non-linear optimization problem, then that time the Chebyshev polynomial will be very useful. So this is Chebyshev polynomial of second kind, and can be defined like this. And this polynomial satisfies this orthogonality relation with respect to this weight function, one minus lambda square square root. So this is a generating function for Chebyshev polynomial. Why do we need this generating function? If we compare the coefficient of t to the power n both sides, then we get this second kind Chebyshev polynomial. So this is the graph. So same way we can discuss the zeros uh, behavior of zeros of ultra spherical Gegenbauer uh, or Gegenbauer polynomials. So same way we can discuss about Hermite polynomials. So Hermite polynomials also uh, satisfy these properties, and this is Lagrange polynomial. So this is a differential equation of uh, this Lagrange polynomial, and it satisfies this uh, orthogonality relation. And this is the generating function of uh, and recalculation for Lagrange polynomials, and this is the Rodriguez formula. So Rodriguez formula is important because from the Rodriguez formula we can find the weight function of the polynomial and other information. So now we move towards different uh, thing, the application of this orthogonal polynomial. We move towards that. So initially we discussed about or when we discuss about classical orthogonal polynomial one property we have discussed that uh, classical or derivative of classical orthogonal polynomials are also uh, classical orthogonal polynomial and it satisfies all the characteristic or property uh, characteristics of orthogonal polynomials so but question is that why do we need a derivative of orthogonal polynomial we consider this is term level differential equation for example so this is nothing but first class or ar jacobi polynomial it has a regular shell of 0 minus 1 so how to solve it we know so before solving this differential equation what we do we differentiate this differential equation with respect to x k times where k less than n you can differentiate on time two times three times according to your wish it should be less than the uh, n okay and we denote zn as dk dxk one x then we apply frobenius method to this differential equation 12 and applying frobenius method we will get solution like this this zn minus k is known as the kth derivative of r jacobi polynomials now suddenly it may be a question why should we study this we will see that so this property this if we consider this uh, this uh, polynomial zn minus k we can see that this zn minus k after differentiating uh, satisfies orthogonality relation with respect to this weight function if you put k is equal to 0 you can find the weight function for first order derivative similar way for any third order derivative you can find so this is a outline of the proof i am skipping it is just you just find that adjoint form and the multiply and do some calculation you will uh, get uh, this result now let us see some particular case suppose p is equal to 
force not force not to and q is equal to 0 then we can see that this polynomial satisfies orthogonality relation up to 200 degree that's why it is called finite so if you take m n greater than 200 so if we if i take 200 on degree polynomial it will not satisfy the orthogonality property that's why it is called finite class so it is preserving the finite class property and it has self adjoint form and it has wrote this formula huh. so examples for n is equal to k k plus 1 k plus 2 we will get this kind of particular polynomials you see zero degree polynomial 1 this is a first degree polynomial second degree polynomial so we can generate this kind of you, you can generate your own polynomial using this like this so this is a norm square value of this polynomial and definitely from the norm you can see that it's a l2 norm and say hilbert space so orthogonal polynomial actually classical orthogonal polynomial it's a l2 space and this satisfies this three term reconciliation also and this is the generating function for this so using this generating function also we can generate this polynomial so this that's why, see, this relation shows that why it's called R Jacobi polynomial. Because this polynomial can be expressed in terms of Jacobi polynomial. So that's why this Ramanuski polynomial is known as R Jacobi polynomial. Because it can be expressed in terms of Jacobi polynomial. So, and this is, since this is classical orthogonal polynomial, so this polynomial can also be expressed in terms of hypergeometric function and actually Gaussian hypergeometric function. Now, we apply the orthogonal polynomial in Gauss integration theory, or you can say numerical application. So this is a general Gauss quadrature formula. It can be found, uh, uh, found in any well-known books of numerical analysis. So in Gauss uh, in the, uh, quadrature formula, it's a well-known formula. Here, Rn m is the remainder term. And actually, it's a error term, remainder term. So what will you do? We'll apply on orthogonal polynomial and check which polynomial gives us better result. So this is just procedure. So we have just applied what we did actually in that uh, remainder term, Rn. We have used the weight function of our R Jacobi polynomial. Actually, this is not R Jacobi polynomial. This is a k time differentiation of R Jacobi polynomial. This is the weight function for that. So we are using here this uh, RNF. Now we can see an interesting thing. Here K stands for derivative, the times of derivative. So initially what we did, we have considered some level differential equation and we have uh, considered K order derivative. So actually we have uh, the k order differential polynomial. So if we take k is equal to zero, that means original polynomial without any differentiation. So if we apply R Jacobi polynomial without differentiating, our remainder term rem uh, will be like this, 6.625 into 10 to the power minus 14. This is the error for this particular case, q is equal to zero and some particular values. But if you differentiate on more time, Suppose first time differentiation, then we get 2.55 into 10 to the power minus 17. You can see that errors are decreasing. For second time differentiation, you can see 10 to the power minus 20. For third time differentiation, 10 to the power minus 24. So, so you increase the number of differentiation, we get the less error. So that's the important. So instead of using the original orthogonal polynomial, if we use the derivative polynomial, we'll get le less error. So that's, that is the one uh, uh, important application of uh, orthogonal polynomial in approximation theory or numerical analysis. Now, my another question is that, we have so many polynomials, which polynomial will give you the least error or less error? We have Jacobi polynomial, we have Lagarde polynomial. So here, for example, if we consider R Jacobi and Jacobi, we see that we have already checked it that the finite class of orthogonal polynomial is to give better result, means less error. So this is on property. So here we have fixed 
the value of p and where is the value of q and here we have oh, sorry it's not working just pardon uh, just computer is is stuck I think it's again again started working. Okay, so if you fix p and vary q, you'll get again. You can see that for increasing the number of times of differentiation, we get less error. So if you are not comfortable with uh, tables, you can see with the graph here along x-axis or real axis we have k, the number of times of differentiation. So you increase the number of times of differentiation, you can see the errors are becoming very less. You see the right hand side graph. So you, we increase the number of differentiation, it gives us less error. So it has some observation that higher order derivatives of general or, or, or uh, orthogonal polynomials provides us better, uh, uh, provides us less error and better results. And instead of Orthogonal polynomial, if we apply its derivative, it satisfies orthogonality relation, reconciliation, hypergeometric representation, everything, and numerical. And it, these orthogonal polynomials and its derivatives are very really useful for numerical quadrature and intermolation formula. And it has some interesting properties of errors. Now, before moving towards on real life example, we should know about uh, some uh, basic knowledge, uh, basic uh, topics about uh, continued fractions. Mm -hmm. Because one thing we know that most of the real life problems can be expressed in terms of differential equations. Most of the problem, not all the problems. And most of the problems are non-linear in nature. So to solve this kind of problems, we need the help of orthogonal polynomials and some special functions. So for that, we need, uh, um, we need uh, continued fractions also. You can see here that root 5 minus 1 by 2, it's irrational number. So uh, we know that if it is as a number is irrational, we cannot express in a specific form like p by q form, we cannot express. So what do we do? So we can write it as 1 by 1 plus root 5 minus 1 by 2. Similar way, we can continue this process. So we can see that root 5 minus 1 by 2 is nothing but 1 by 1 plus 1 by 1 plus in this form. This kind of forms are known as continued fractions. Actually, these are fractions. So fractions are continued. So this ratio is known as golden ratio. This is very, uh, this is very important ratio. The solution of uh, x squared minus x uh, minus 1 is a positive group. And uh, this is irrational number, but this approximation is rational. Why? Same kind of thing we can see here. See pi, 3.14.1592, we cannot find the specific presentation. But we can write pi is equal to 3.14, instead of like, writing like that, 3 plus 1 by 0 0.141592. Similar way, you proceed to the next line, like 3 plus on by 7.0625 like this and you continue. So when you continue this procedure, we can find this fraction. This is another kind of uh, continued fraction. So this is also, so these continued fractions are infinite continued fraction. So one point to be noted here is that if we have irrational number, then we have infinite continued fraction. Infinite in the sense that 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 we, we, we can, it cannot be finite here. We cannot uh, uh, end here. But if uh, instead of instead of irrational number, if we take a rational number, we will always get a finite fraction, finite continued fraction. Now we'll move towards a real life application of orthogonal polynomials. So. I'm going to discuss about birth and death process. So, birth and death process, uh, 
to before going to the to the mathematical structure or mathematical model for that uh, in terms of differential equation let us see what do you mean by birth and death process so suppose you want to get money from a atm and you are in a queue so suppose three persons are standing there and you are the fourth person to get the money so it's it's a queue so after getting uh, the money from the atm machine the first person will go out so your length of the queue will decrease we call it death but meanwhile new person will come and join the queue so fourth person will come and join the queue fifth person will come and join the queue so in same time the length of the queue will also increase this you can call as birth so similar way normal population birth means a newborn baby death means somebody is dying so this has very uh, wide application in population dynamics uh, uh, and uh, queuing theory and other research areas and other uh, and it gives solution for various practical problems so here lambda i denotes the birth rate so from zero stage to one stage some birth is uh, required so when some birth occurs so we call that rate birth rate as lambda so after some birth rate it will go to the next stage and consequently some death rate after some death it, it can come to the previous stage so we can call it as death and actually this was the linear structure but in real life birth death structure may be looking like this complicated and this is general birth and death structure so from one stage to another stage it can be uh, gun so it has application in population dynamics chemical reactions nuclear physics genetic models so actually birth and death process is a stochastic process uh, and stochastic particular case of stochastic process so a stochastic process is a sequence of events in which the outcome at any stage depends on some probability so when you are going to some atm it's a poll that somebody will join the queue or not so and a markov process is a stochastic process with following properties where the number of possible outcomes of stage is finite and outcome at any stage depends on the outcome on the previous stage and the probabilities are constant over time so these are some uh, special cases of markov process and for birth and death we are uh, the transitions transition means one stage to another stage so that is limited to only birth and death so these are some increasing changes so suppose uh, death is uh, so suppose birth is occurring more so we can call that birth rate is increasing like that so i am not going detail in detail in this uh, just i am going to the main equation so any birth and death process satisfies uh, so uh, birth generally birth and death uh, process with uh, lambda with a birth rate lambda and death rate uh, mu satisfies this kind of differential equations and this differential equation is known as kolmogorov differential equation people also call it chapman kolmogorov differential equation so now question is that how to solve this kind of differential equation so this is very difficult question and uh, it's a it's not easy to solve this differential equation so and till now simple and uh, solution for this differential equation or simple answer is not there so what people used to do is that apply to apply method of separation of variables we know the method of separation of variables so you just take pij t is equal to ft qij qfj and you apply method of separation of variables and after certain calculations so whatever i'm doing i'm just uh, uh, telling about the first block the first uh, first set of equations so if we apply method of separation of variables in the first set of equations you will get f dash t upon ft is equal to something we call it minus x so ultimately you will get ft is equal to it is upon minus x t in this form i am hiding some calculations these calculations are available in a book uh, of orthogonal polynomials 
I do not want to discuss the full calculation. So, so if you just proceed with uh, method of separation of variables, then you can see that we'll find a uh, three term recurrence relation in terms of capital F. What is capital F? That is used in the method of separation of variables. And, but problem is that this capital F is not a polynomial. May be polynomial, may not be polynomial. So, uh, and uh, the final solution using separation of variables may be uh, uh, obtained like this. And the full calculation and all the details are available in the book of Ismail, classical and quantum and orthogonal polynomials. If anybody is interested, they can see the proof in this book. So my main aim is not to prove this uh, result. My aim is to consider this three-term reconciliation. So in, in the place of Fn, if we take, consider a function Pnx is equal to minus 1 to the power n and product of mu n, where mu n are death rates, and multiplied by Fn, then, then uh, we get a three-term reconciliation like this. Our main target was this only. Because we know that according to Favre's theorem, if it is a classical orthogonal polynomial, then it will satisfy three-term reconciliation. And if it is satisfying three-term reconciliation, then definitely it will be orthogonal with respect to some weight function. Now, we can see that PNX satisfies three-term reconciliation. So that means definitely this will provide us a classical orthogonal polynomials. Generally, these orthogonal polynomials are known as birth and death ortho, uh, process orthogonal polynomials. So this, you can see that alpha n is equal to lambda n plus mu n. Here, where lambda n are birth rate, mu n are death rates. Same way, beta n is here, lambda n minus 1 into mu n. So, this three-term reconciliation is combined of birth rate and death rate of a system. So, if we know birth rate and death rate, we can construct orthogonal polynomials. So, that may lead to a solution of a real life problem. So you, if you know lambda and mu, that means birth rate and death rate, you put the value here, we'll get Pn, so it will provide us some uh, uh, orthogonal polynomial with respect to some weight function. So how to get? The simplest example are cases of birth and death process are uh, linear cases. So. Every classical orthogonal polynomial are birth and death process polynomial because every classical orthogonal polynomial satisfies three term reconciliation. For a simple example, if we take birth rate equal, G equal to lambda n plus one and death rate is equal to n plus lambda, n plus alpha, then it provides us Lagarde polynomial. Means Lagarde polynomials are birth and death polynomials with respect to lambda n and uh, with respect to but this birth rate and death rate. And we already know the weight function for Lagarde polynomial. Similar way, some constant multiplication of Lagarde polynomial can be obtained for this kind of birth rate and death rates. Zeros, so already we know that the zeros of orthogonal polynomials lie inside the interval of orthogonality. So the zeros of birth and death process polynomials belong to zero infinity. So now, we had this system of differential equation and we were unable to solve it. So another alternative uh, approach people, people used to apply is Laplace transformation. Generally, we apply when we are unable to solve some problems. So if you take Laplace transformation to the transition probability, so transition probability means uh, going from one stage to another stage. So then we can see that the Laplace transformation of this transition probability can be expressed in terms of continued fraction. That's why we have discussed the continued fraction. So, this kind of continued fractions are known as is fraction. Now, one question may come into our mind that we have simple series expansion. Why should someone consider this kind of big continued fraction exp expansion? Main reason is that the rate of convergence is uh, very high, high, is higher than the series. And sometimes if the formal power series does not converge, that time we can apply uh, continued fractions to get some approximated value. 
So these are some special cases with uh, another. So it is difficult to write continued fraction like in this form. So in that case, we can use this kind of symbols for continued fraction. Uh -huh. Now, the remaining thing is that, that we have this continued fraction. Is it possible to express in terms of simple form, like P by Q form or rational approximation? Answer is yes. We can express in the form of AK is by BK. So this is actually K time, uh, K uh, fraction. But if we have infinite fraction, then also we can uh, express the continued fraction in terms of A by B. And using Wallis formula, we can compute. So uh, these are some special mathematical models. So if uh, you consider some part real life problem where birth rate plus death rate is equal to one and this is equal to Q to the power n, then you can see that this can be expressed in terms of Ramanujan continued fraction. So that after applying uh, some inverse Laplace transformation or different kind of properties, we can get the solution. Similar way, you can see that uh, hypergeometric function also can be expressed in terms of continued fractions. And these are some corresponding birth and death rates. Similar way, suppose this, this kind of sequences are known as chain sequences. So if we have birth and death in this form, then we can find a continued fraction like this and we can handle the situation. So main thing is these are tools to handle some, to solve some problems. It may not give us a direct solution, but it will be useful to solve uh, other problems because uh, uh, ratio of hypergeometric functions or hypergeometric functions are useful to express other functions, uh, special functions or polynomials. So this is an interesting uh, property of continued fraction that one by one plus j can be expressed in the, in the product of two continued fractions. And these are the corresponding birth and death rates for this corresponding process. Similar way, this can also be done. And these are the corresponding birth and death rates. And one can see the book of H.S. Wall, Theory of Continued Fractions, to get these ideas. So relation between uh, these two BDPs. So suppose you have lambda n and uh, lambda n just two different kind of uh, BDP, uh, birth and death rates. So, so these are uh, these properties are satisfies. So, so, so to know about uh, orthogonal polynomials, continued fractions, and related things and special function, one can see the book of Andrews Askey Roy. This book may be useful, very useful for special functions. But if you are interested to read about orthogonal polynomials, then the Ch book of Chiara will be much uh, useful for you. And book of Ismail will provide the applications and information of different kind of uh, polynomials. And the similar books uh, are there for Renvillier, Time, and main book the continued for the continued function is HS wall, so one can use the book of HS wall for the theory of continued fractions. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay home. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much. We are ever grateful to you for your remarkable speech. It is very informative and very well represented um, it will surely add excellence to the knowledge base of uh, our audience and uh, it will uh, surely fulfill our uh, goal. So, um, now uh, I have some uh, questions uh, which yes. I have already uh, put in the chat box. Uh, two of them I have um, received from uh, the YouTube audience. One, is, uh, one question is asked by Nirvik Mashanto who is asking that why we introduce such weight functions, what is the need of such functions, and another is uh, by Shubhash Mondol. And uh, uh, Mr. Anish Kumar has also put two questions here. So, sir, if you please uh, uh, go through these four questions. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. Can you ask me the question one by one, please? So it will be uh, uh, easy for me to under, uh, understand and, uh, and uh, answer. But one by one, please. Okay, uh, 
first question is asked by Nirbhish Mahanto. He is asking that uh, why do we introduce such weight functions? What is the need of such functions? Weight function. Weight functions. Why okay. do we introduce weight functions? Okay. Without weight function, that orthogonality relation will not be satisfied. Uh, that's the main reason. Another thing, you can see that the inner product is defined. Uh, uh, that it, okay. I'll I'll go to the main slide so that it will be easy for us to discuss that. Yes. So you can see that that uh, inner product of P N and P M are, uh, are uh, is there. So here. If you do not use the weight function, then your uh, integration may not exist somewhere. Sometimes this orthogonality property may not exist. Another thing is that when you uh, see this this property, okay, uh, uh, gram smith orthogonality. When we apply gram smith orthogonality. This, at time we have to apply uh, inner product and to define the inner product weight function is very uh, uh, much uh, required otherwise uh, what uh, weight function plays role here is that uh, uh, wx pnx pmx dx is there so mainly and uh, actually orthogonality uh, relation is defined as integration a to b pnx pmx b of mu x where mu x is positive borel measure and mu is if mu is uh, uh, absolutely continuous then b of mu x can be expressed as wx dx so that you can integrate it so without a weight function uh, it will, it may violate the riemann integration theory i think okay sir next question is asked by shubhash mondol who is asking that is there any general method for solving any type of second order strom liouville equation okay, okay. actually uh, this strom liouville equation is a uh, differential equation with variable coefficient so best way is that to apply series solution method first you have to check whether uh, whether your point is uh, ordinary point or not if the point is ordinary point uh, then you apply series solution otherwise you have to check whether the point is Uh, regular similar point or not? If the point is regular similar point, then you apply Frobenius method. And if uh, again uh, if your point is not uh, regular similar point, you can modify it that uh, Frobenius method. You can solve. Otherwise, this is the standard procedure for solving differential equation with variable coefficients. More than that, if you are interested, you can use contoured fractions also. But that is generally not uh, in the syllabus of the uh, use your PG course. But this is the standard procedure. Or uh, solving uh, this uh, problem. Okay, sir. In the meantime, uh, we have got reply from Nirvik Mashanto. He says in the YouTube chat box that uh, he has understood your answer, and he is uh, quite okay with that. Now, Anish Kumar has asked you that um, uh, uh, with respect to which function here we checking error after differentiating classical orthogonal polynomial. Uh, can Can you please repeat? Them? Yeah, yeah. I'm repeating this again. With respect to which function, here we are yes. checking error after differentiating classical orthogonal polynomial. With respect to which function means? Uh, okay. Generally, what happened here? I just I'll tell you. I understand the question. Actually, we have the Stamlier differential, and we are differentiating with. The, I just show you. Uh, where, where is it? Right there. I'll show that. Actually, what we did, we have differentiated with respect to and we uh, uh, we uh, with respect uh, to k times, and we got like that. But when you are approximating. So this is this is the uh, solution uh, after using Frobenius method. So this is the orthogonal with respect to this weight function. So actually we have used this weight function for approximation problem. You can see here. You can see here we have used that uh, same weight for approximation. Okay. 
actually differentiated with respect to x itself. Okay. Any further question? Uh, there is another question which is also asked by Anish Kumar. Yeah. How orthogonal polynomial and continued fraction relating with each other? How okay. orthogonal okay. polynomial and continued okay. fraction are related okay. with each other? This is an interesting question. And uh, uh, I think that this is the best question I feel because uh, it's a very important. You see, then for this, what we should go? We should go to the uh, three term reconciliation. You can always rearrange three term reconciliation in terms of continued fraction and that will lead to uh, uh, some g fraction that is a special type of continued fraction which is used for birth and death process and this kind of thing so for example here on three term reconciliation is there for the where is that okay i'll show that i think somewhere it is there okay. for example this is the three term reconciliation if you can rearrange this three term reconciliation, how we did it for pi or other function, other uh, values, so you can rearrange in a such a way that it can be expressed in terms of uh, continuous fraction. So from three term reconciliation of orthogonal polynomial, we can always generate a continued fraction. And that will uh, that has wide application, especially in Markov process and birth process. Okay. Next. I am unable to hear. I am unable to hear, madam. <coughs> Sir, I am unable to hear. Am I audible? Okay. Uh, now, now you are audible. Yes. Okay. okay. Anish Kumar has replied that um, he has got his answer. Now, uh, I will ask uh, Dr. Obhijit Banerjee. Uh, my co convener to uh, moderate uh, further this question and answer okay. session and also to, uh, to host the next uh, session of uh, today's uh, program. Obhijita, if you have any further question, please uh, proceed. No, no, it's someone among the audience refer Nikki for a poor of method okay, related to the solution of uh, second order differential equations related to special functions. Mm -hmm. so, if there is any information, sort of please. Uh, sir, pardon, sir. Can you repeat, please, sir? Uh, someone among the audience yeah. refer Nikki for a method related, uh, yeah. related to the second order differential equation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, um, related to the second order differential equation in the perspective mm -hmm. of special functions. Uh -huh. uh, if there is so um, some link about. Okay, there are several. Uh, so, uh, Nikki Fara actually book is also there. Are you talking about the book or method? I don't know. <laughs> some audience. Some okay. audience so, yeah, there, several methods are there. Several methods are there. Uh, like continued fraction method and Nikki Fara books uh, methods are there. So, for that method, I can just, I didn't mention here, but for them, I can just uh, suggest some reference here. Uh, uh, just one second, I'll share it. In my last slide, I, I just suggest uh, there to see the book of Renville and book of uh, NMT May. There, in that books, there are several methods available. Uh, they can apply it. Okay. Uh, is it a standard method? No, actually, actually, uh, for this kind of uh, we generally use uh, a method of um, uh, what do you call it? that? Uh, Provenius method is a standard method. That is a actually uh, particular cases methods. So some continued fraction methods are also available. So it depends on the problem actually, because sometimes uh, uh, you know that uh, solving differential equation is not easy. So it depends on the equation. So it depends on the situation we have to apply the method. So sometimes maybe the Mikukura method may be useful. Sometimes maybe series solution method may be useful. So it depends on the particular problem. Okay. <laughs> Okay, since we cannot avoid limitation uh, set by time, so we have to end this session right now. Please allow us to mass forward for the next speech and also allow me to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Vikas Chakraborty. Hello, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes you are. You, yes, you are. 
Dr. Vikas Chattaburti received his master and PhD degree from University of Kollani in 2013 and 2017 respectively. He is currently working as assistant professor at the Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda Centenary College, West Bengal. He is interested in complex analysis and visualization in teaching and learning mathematics. The title of his today's talk is Visual Proofs of Some Well-Known Results. I would like to invite him to deliver his talk. Dr. Chakraborty, please take over from here. Um, am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I am thankful to the Department of Mathematics, Borbeta College, for giving me this opportunity. And I mean, I am very thankful to Dr. Ovijit Ganji, sir, uh, for his inspiration to give this kind of lecture. Okay. Is uh, my slide is uh, visible? Is the slide is visible? Uh, no. Not, uh, no, no. Present your slide, I guess. Yes, now it is. Yes, yes. Yeah, actually, some network problem is there here today. This is problem. Okay. Actually, this is a classroom lecture and especially uh, for UG students. Okay. And the aim of this lecture is to inspire the UG students to visualize some mathematical ideas. Okay. Okay. Actually, that uh, title is actually visual proofs of some well-known results. We have seen many results in our undergraduate text. And uh, here we try to give uh, some visualization of them. Okay. First, I, I, I say what is visual proofs or what is proof without words? Of course, proof without words are not really proofs. Generally, proof without words are pictures or diagrams that help readers to visualize why a particular mathematical statement may be true, or also to see how one might begin to go about proving it true. Actually, we teachers must try to develop the ability to visualize mathematics in our students. Of course, many times it needs some words to explain, so it is not always without words. In this presentation, we will present some elegant visual demonstrations of certain mathematical ideas which you will enjoy. Okay. Uh, first, we uh, present some uh, visual demonstration of mathematical identities. Okay. I think my slide is not visible. I think what is required. No, light is not changing. Uh, sir, Just if you don't have any problem, then uh, you can mail this to me or Obhijit Da, and we can scroll it down, and you will describe the slides if you face yeah, any that is better. problem regarding that is better. Uh, this. Yeah, this one. Uh, I'm I mail you. Okay, I email you. Uh, in uh, to uh, Dr. Raj, look, la, 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 okay? I email you. Okay, you have mailed me to ju.rajlakshmi, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from that mail, I get the uh, schedule, etc. Okay, 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 okay. okay. One sec, let me open that. Yeah. 
please give me one sec. I will. Uh, I'm going to arrange. Uh, But uh, in between time, I need to write something. So how is this possible? Excuse me? Actually, my, uh, when I am presenting the slide, as well as I, I, I want to write something in desktop. Uh, so is it possible? Uh, actually, um, OK, sir. Uh, you proceed with your presentation. If uh, okay. there, you face any problem again, then I will start presenting from here but okay. um, i mean writing simultaneously writing actually uh, i don't think it is possible for me actually uh, uh, you start uh, we'll okay. manage okay okay no, no problem okay so first i uh, i first i want to present a, a very famous identity okay that is the sum of first n natural numbers is n into n plus 1 by 2 okay and this is very famous and we know it from our 12 standards right so if I ask you to prove this identity, uh, basically what you do, you do uh, you do some principle of mathematical induction. You apply principle of, of mathematical induction and you prove this. Okay, but here we give some visual presentation of this identity. Okay. Okay. So for that, uh, we first uh, need to uh, uh, need to introduce uh, one idea. So first, I ask you one question. So what is the area of a unit square? Just a minute. If I take a unit square, in problem. Just a minute. Just a minute to talk. Just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, no problem. Take. Just from morning and then some little problem is going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's okay. You, you take your time, no problem. Yes. You take your time. So uh, uh, first we demonstrate that the sum of first in natural numbers is n multiplied by n plus 1 by 2. Okay. For that, we need one thing. First, we uh, consider a uh, unit square, oh, one unit square. Okay. One unit square. So that, what is the area of that? That area is actually 1. And one thing I ask here, yeah. can you prove this, that the area of a unit square is 1? This is, a, uh, this is my question to UG student. Actually, this is an axiom that uh, this is an axiom that uh, that the area of a unit square is one. Okay. That's, uh, so I just mentioned it. Okay. And here uh, we always mean that one means the area of a unit square. Okay. So so what is, so naturally what is the meaning of two here? So meaning of two is actually two multiplied by one. That means here we add two unit square side by side. Okay, so the, the meaning of two uh, in, uh, uh, to us is uh, sum of two uh, unit square. Okay, so here look that uh, uh, one means one means one unit square, then two means two unit square, then three means three unit square, and then four means four unit square, and so on. Five means five unit square, six means uh, six unit square, and seven means seven unit square. Okay. So we just uh, put all the squares in this way, right? And then, and then, 
and then just and, uh, uh, we join this point by this point by a line segment. Okay. So uh, by this we have uh, one big triangle. Just you see that we have a one big triangle and some smaller triangles. Some smaller triangles, right? Here uh, you see that uh, it has seven smaller triangles are there. Okay. Because we consider 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. So here we have one big triangle and seven smaller triangles. Okay. Now, what is, the, what is the area of this bigger triangle? The area of the bigger triangle is, uh, the, actually the height is 7. Okay. And the base is 7. Okay. So the area is actually half uh, multiplied by 7 into 7. Okay, and what is the uh, area of the smaller uh, seven smaller triangle? Uh, look, the uh, length is one and the height is one. So area is actually half into one into one. So here, this figure represent that the sum of first seven natural number is actually half into seven into seven plus 7 into half into 1 into 1, right? So just to take uh, uh, half uh, 7 by 2 outside of that, so you have 7 plus 1, okay? So in, if you, if you uh, just apply this process up to n times, uh, uh, before starting this lecture, I have already mentioned that proof without words or visual proofs are not actually proofs, okay? So this is the uh, uh, actually a kind of visualization, okay? So just we uh, just uh, we just uh, apply this method up to n, right? First n natural numbers. So just if you uh, do this the same process up to n natural numbers, so you have seven is replaced by n. Okay. So actually the sum of first n natural numbers is n multiplied by n plus one by two. Okay. So this is the visualization that the sum of first n natural numbers is n multiplied by n plus one by two. And this proof is given by I. Richards. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next identity is this. This is again another uh, well-known identity in, in our uh, undergraduate class. That is the sum of the square of first n natural number is n multiplied by n plus 1 multiplied by 2n plus 1 divided by 6. Okay. So we have uh, give uh, uh, another visualization for this identity. Okay. Sir, sir, one thing I am going to interrupt you. Actually, yes. the, in YouTube, the audience are uh, telling that if you kindly control L, I mean, press control L, I mean, enlarge your screen, screen then it will yeah. be much more visible in uh, yeah, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I know it, but but uh, uh, but I, I am uh, uh, controlling two things. One is my PDF uh, and another is uh, uh, writing pad. So okay. uh, it is difficult actually. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, sir. No problem. Continue. Okay. Okay. So uh, now uh, I am going to present uh, the other identity. This is very famous. And if I ask you the proof of this identity, then again you uh, you go for, uh, for and you apply principle of mathematical in induction. Yes, that, that kind of uh, identity has another proof. There is there are probabilistic proof. Okay. Uh, but the, the easiest proof uh, you know that is uh, uh, application of principle of mathematical induction. But here we, uh, we uh, give another visualization of this identity. Okay. okay. Just uh, see uh, here uh, again, I have already mentioned uh, that one means uh, the area of a unit square. Okay. Uh, just a minute. And uh, so, what is, uh, so what is one square? Uh, just uh, that one square means actually in my lecture area of a unit square. Okay, so what is two square? So two square is actually four into one. So you uh, so actually this is actually four unit square. So this is a block of four unit square. Okay, and similarly what is three square? Three square. This is actually nine into multiplied by one. Right. So this is actually block of nine unit square. Okay. So see this uh, figure. So this is actually one. Okay, this is one, one square actually, and uh, that uh, that that portion is two square. This 
just count it one two three four so for two square then uh, that uh, go to the violet blocks one two three four five six seven eight nine so this is actually three square okay then uh, one two three four and five six and uh, up to sixteen that so this block represent four square and and again this green block represent five square actually uh, here we have uh, we consider up to five square one square plus two square plus three square plus four square plus five square you can uh, just uh, proceed by this way okay so we add add them one square plus two square plus up to five square so if we add them so we have a blocks of unit square so this is the block so this is the block of uh, so those kind, uh, those number of uh, unit square. Okay. So now we just rearrange this block in a another way. Okay. You, you just you look at the uh, this block, the green blocks. Here you have one, two, three, four, five rows, right? In each row you have uh, five blocks. Okay. So you have five rows in that bigger blocks. Okay. So you just uh, 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 break. The uh, bigger uh, square into uh, into five different parts. So first row, this is the second row, this is the, row, this is the fourth row, and this is the fifth row. So you have uh, in that block you have five rows, right? So you just break them into five parts. This one the first, the second, third, fourth, fifth. Okay. Now look at the other uh, that that block. In the in that block you have four rows. One, two, three, four, right? And now you break that block into four parts and put them in the previous one, right? So by this way. So this is the first block, second block, third block, fourth, fourth block, okay? Now you, you consider that the block, violet blocks, okay? Here you have three rows, right? And you break it into three parts. So this is the first one, second one, third one, okay? Now you consider this block. Here you have two rows. You break into two parts the first one second one okay and finally you have the single block just to put here so this block can be written as sum of one two three four five blocks so you just uh, just uh, you uh, you consider this block and you uh, you just uh, partition that, that block into five parts so you have five blocks okay now you take uh, next step is that you take the two copies of this block Okay, you take two copies of this block. So you have this block two times, this block two times, this block two times, this block two times, and finally this block two times. Okay, so you consider the double of this block. So you glue, you glue those blocks. So you considering double of these blocks. So you just glue them. Just look, uh, the, uh, here you have two blocks. Just uh, look at this one. So you have this block, and you just uh, rotate uh, rotate that one and add. So you have a square, okay. And then you take this block twice and add in this way, right? Again, you take this block twice and add. Again, this you take this block, you add. You have a rectangle, and you take this block twice and join them side by side. So if we uh, consider this block twice, so we have a uh, new five blocks in this way. Okay, now you consider three times of this block. So three times of these blocks means this block and five those blocks. Okay, so uh, these blocks means one times, and these blocks are two times. So you add those all blocks together. So this is the three times. Just you look this figure just use look this figure so this is the first block this is the s right then you put this block here and upon that you put this block and on that you put this block and upon that you put this block and finally you put this block here so if you arrange this block blocks are in this way you have a nice rectangle okay now look at the rectangle what is the length of this rectangle? You see that 1 plus 1 plus 1, 2. Here, 1 plus 1 plus 1, 3, 3. So, this is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. So, if you uh, apply this process up to n, so the length of this block is actually 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus up to n. 
Okay, so 1 plus 2 plus up to n. And what is the ba base of this block? So this is actually 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 5 plus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5. So 5 plus 5 plus 1. So 2 into 5 plus 1. Okay, so if you apply it for up to n, so this is actually n plus n plus 1. So this is actually n plus n plus 1. Okay. So, so, so what is, what is this block? This is the three times of this block. So, the sum is actually three times of that block 3s and 3s is actually, the, what is the area of a rectangle? Length into breadth. So, length is 1 plus 2 plus up to n and breadth is 2n plus 1. So, what is s? Just to add, just a simple calculation, in, uh, this is actually n into n plus 1 by 2 and this is actually 2n plus 1. So, actually s equal to n into n plus 1 into 2n plus 1 by 6. Okay, so now you can ask me a question that why should I do this kind of juggling or puzzling? The actual thing is that uh, if you apply principle of mathematical induction, that proof is very easy. But this is a visualization. This is uh, you can uh, you can uh, uh, see that here is no words. If I uh, I don't explain anything, just one picture is there, and that picture tells that this picture, this block tells that this is nothing but sum of uh, square of first n natural numbers is n into n plus 1 into 2n plus 1 by 6. Okay, so that is the beauty behind uh, that things. Okay, and this is the paper written by me. This is my first paper on this area and this paper is published in uh, Mathematical Intelligence and later it is re republished in Scientific American. Okay. So next I, uh, okay. Next, I show another identity, and that is also uh, known to you that uh, the uh, cube of first n natural number is n into n plus 1 by 2 power squ uh, whole square. Okay, so uh, this is another identity, and it is uh, very well known to you. And this identity has several uh, different kind of proofs. One easy proof is again using principle of mathematical induction, and another proof is available that is using probability. Okay, but here again, here we give a visual uh, a visualization of this proof. Okay. Okay. Give another visualization. Okay. Again, uh, here uh, we consider one cube. So, what is uh, we can think one cube as we can think one cube as one into 1 into 1 square. Okay. Again, we can think 2 cube as uh, 2 into 2 square. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so 1 cube means we, we, are go we are going to consider 1 unit square. Okay. So, 2 cube means 2 cube means we are going to 2 blocks. Each block contains each block contains 4 unit square. So, this is a, uh, uh, this is this is actually we have discussed that, that this is actually 2 square. So, 2 square plus 2 square is 2 cube. So, 2 cube, 2 cube means 2 into 2 square and similarly 3 cube means <coughs> 3 cube uh, similarly uh, 3 cube means uh, 3 uh, 3 into 3 square. So, we are considering 3 blocks and each block contains 9 unit square. Okay. Now you look at the uh, figure. J uh, they first consider they first consider one unit square. So this is actually one cube. Okay. Then uh, then they consider then they consider. So this is actually one two three four two square. So we, uh, so we can uh, we can think as uh, this uh, this square this uh, uh, block as sum of this is sum of these two blocks okay so four blocks can be uh, think as sum of two plus two blocks so we place uh, so this is one block and we just uh, divide one block into two parts and place it here right place it here so actually uh, this part this part actually uh, in uh, to us two cube. Okay. Now, now just look at the figure. So this is actually one cube. 
this is actually two cube and next you consider uh, three cube then you have three blocks just to paste three uh, there's three blocks here like this one block two block three bo block okay then you are considering four cube so you have four blocks so you are considering four blocks this is one block one block two block the three block and you have one extra block that extra block, you divide it into two parts and place then between this place. Okay. Just you repeat this process. If you repeat this process, you have a bigger block. Okay. In that bigger block, you have see, you just you look, observe that this is again a square. This forms a square and uh, the side is actually, this is actually one. Just look, this is actually two. Then this is actually three. Then you just look, this is actually four. Then this is actually five. This is actually 6 and up to this is actually n. So, the sum of the block is actually uh, area of a square whose side is actually 1 plus 2 plus up to n. Okay. So, this square. And this is nothing but uh, the, 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 uh, just to rearrange these blocks. Okay. Just to rearrange these blocks. So, the sum of uh, 1 cube plus 2 cube plus up to n cube is nothing but sum uh, square of 1 plus 2 plus n. Okay. So, and this is nothing but n into n plus 1 by 2 square. Okay. So, this is another visualization of our well-known identities. And this is uh, actually uh, established by J. Berilov. Okay. This proof is given by J. Berilov. Okay. Next, we demonstrate some mathematical inequalities. Okay, uh, we, we are going to give some mathematical. Inequalities. The first inequality is arithmetic mean is greater or equal to geometric mean. We have to establish that one. Okay, and again, this proof is very easy in undergraduate class. Uh, our teachers do some calculations and establish. But here, we present a visual proof uh, that the arithmetic mean of two numbers is bigger than geometric mean of that two numbers. Okay. We have to present this one. Okay, so we know that if we if we consider uh, two real numbers, two positive real numbers, we are uh, we are considering two positive real numbers. Okay, A and B. So now we are uh, uh, we uh, draw a rectangle we draw a rectangle with side a and b so this is a rectangle uh, this is a rectangle whose uh, side is this is a and this is actually b okay now we extend this length okay we we extend uh, this, this line to uh, uh, up to that so this length is actually a okay and this is b just to uh, just to draw in this way oh, sorry this is a again okay and we extend uh, this length. Huh? Yes. Uh, so uh, just to draw this figure, right? This is B. This is B. A. Okay. Now you see that this is a bigger uh, square. The outer square is a bigger square whose side is actually A plus B, right? And in, in, inside there are five rectangles. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. And this is a rectangle. The, the area of that rectangle is actually AB. Okay. Again, area of that rectangle is again AB. And this is again rectangle. Area of this rectangle is AB. And area of this rectangle is AB. Okay. So now question, what is the area of this square? So obviously the area of this square is actually A plus B whole square minus 4AB. And from figure, this is positive. You see that it occupies some area. Right. So, since it is an area, so uh, you know that, that is again axiom, the area cannot be negative. That is, an, uh, that is again axiom. So, this must be positive. And, and this, is nothing, uh, this is actually nothing but a plus b by 2 uh, whole square. Uh, so, this is actually greater than cos square root of b. So, this is the visualization that arithmetic mean 
is uh, greater or equal to geometric mean of two numbers. There are several proofs uh, that uh, arithmetic mean greater or equal to geometric mean greater or equal to age, uh, harmonic, uh, harmonic mean. There are several visualization. At least uh, uh, 10 to 15 visualizations are there, but we are not going there. Okay. Just to, uh, with, uh, here we demonstrate one. Uh, next, we uh, discuss another inequality. Okay, that is sine function is sub additive. What is sub additive function? So a function f uh, on some certain domain is called sub additive if f of x plus y is less or equal to f x plus f of y. So here we have to show that we, we have to show visually that sine of a plus b is less or equal to sine a plus sine b provided a plus b is less or equal to pi. We have to uh, show it by visually. Okay. So, uh, uh, what is sub additive function? Just a minute. Function is called sub additive if f of x plus y is less or equal to f x plus f of y. So, here we, we, we establish that sine function is sub additive uh, if that uh, a plus b is less or equal to y, and that proof is totally visual. Okay. So, for that, we need one, uh, one well known result that. If it is A and this is B and the angle is C, then what is the area of this triangle? Area actually, area actually half AB sin C. We use this result uh, to visualize this picture. Okay. So you see that uh, we, we, we take, we take uh, X1, X2, Xn such that the sum of them, X1 plus X2 plus Xn is this or equal to pi. Okay. So, so just we uh, uh, so uh, we take this angle. This is x1 uh, angle x1. This is actually x2, and then this is x3, and onwards. Lastly, this is xn. Okay. Now we are, we are uh, uh, now uh, now we see that, and this is the uh, total angle. X1 plus x2 plus xn. Okay. Now we consider a, a circle of radius one. So this is the circle of radius one. So this is the radius. And the radius is actually one. Okay. Now you look this triangle. Here you have a one triangle, right? You have a one triangle. This is a triangle. Okay. So what is the area of this triangle? The area is half. Side is one and one. One multiplied by one, and sine of angle between that sides. This is actually x1 plus x2 plus xn. Okay, and now you consider this triangle. This is a smaller triangle. What is the area of this triangle? This triangle, the area of this triangle is half 1, 1 into sine of x1. Now, what is the area of this triangle? Area of this triangle. This is a half multiplied by 1 into 1 sine of x2. And similarly, so what is the uh, uh, total sum? Of all the all those smaller triangles, so this is actually sum of half sine of x n and okay, this is a sum. Okay, now you look this figure. You you see that this smaller triangle has the smaller area than all the triangles. So from figure, it is clear that this sum is less or equal to this sum. So so this figure this figure tells us that sum of sine of xn is less or equal to sine of sum of xn. So, this proof is totally visual. Okay. So, sine function is sub additive if their angles, sum of their angles is strictly less than pi. Okay. Next, we uh, show, uh, next we uh, present another visualization that tan function is super additive. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, 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 I will give some reference after this lecture. Okay. Okay. 
so uh, so next uh, uh, so next uh, next we will show that the tangent is super additive okay we will present visually this thing so we will present the tangent function is super additive so when a function is called super additive a function on a certain domain is called super additive if f of x plus y is greater or equal to f of x plus f of y okay just here i mention one thing you know the definition of additive function a, a function if is called additive if f of x plus y equal to f of x plus f of y then the function is called additive function and you you are familiar with this, this definition when you learn continuity or linear transformation but here we are using super additive function and sub additive function okay okay so here uh, so uh, uh, super additive function is a function f on a certain domain if f of x plus y uh, is greater or equal to fx plus fy okay here we have give some uh, visualization that tangent function is super additive when there's uh, the sum of the angles is is or equal to pi by 2 under this restriction so this is actually proof uh, this is uh, this is the actually proof uh, and when you see this proof in some text in some books or reference book or uh, some uh, paper they only did some only this picture no uh, no words are there they just draw this picture and this picture is sufficient for this proof but here i uh, i i i i i explain it okay so uh, we, we are considering the angle x, so this is this is the angle x1 then this is the angle x2 and x3 lastly x this is the angle xn okay and now we are considering a right angle triangle we are considering a right angle triangle where the base the length of the base is 1 okay okay and this angle is x1 if this angle is x1 and the base is 1 if base is 1 so what is the length of the height what is the height the, the length of the height is obviously tan x1 okay and and similarly if uh, if this is actually x2 this is actually x2 uh, then just uh, we considering this rectangle uh, this right angle triangle so then this height actually tan tan x2 okay and similarly if it is this angle is xk so this this length is this length is tan of xk because uh, this, this is a right angle triangle okay now you look at the bigger right angle triangle this is a bigger right angle triangle okay so what uh, and the sum of those angles sum of those angles is actually sum over xk k runs from 1 to n okay and this length is actually 1 so what is the length of height 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 so height is actually tan of x1 x2 xn okay so this height so this height this height is actually tan of sum over xn okay and here this length is tan x1 this length is tan x2 this length is tan xk and lastly this length is tan xn okay now we recall one result if we draw a straight line and one point outside of the straight line so what is the minimum distance minimum distance is the perpendicular distance and this is a very easy result uh, uh, so this is, this length is the minimum okay so here you look this distance is uh, less than this distance okay similarly this distance is less than this distance this distance is less than this distance and lastly this distance is less than this distance and this distance is same so here you see that sum of these distances are strictly less than length of this straight line okay so tan x1 plus tan x2 plus tan xn this summation is strictly less than tan of x1 x2 xn okay so this is this figures tells us that tan function is uh, super additive and you see that that sum of these angles is strictly less than pi by 2 the sum is strictly less than uh, pi by 2 okay 
So tangent function is super additive. Okay. And this proof is given by Rob Pratt. Okay. Okay. Next, we pre present another thing. Okay. That is, you know E and pi are transcendental number. If, you, if I ask you to give uh, examples of transcendental number, then the very common examples, examples are E and pi. Okay. So, e, uh, e and pi are two transcendental numbers. Here, we compare two real numbers, pi to the power E and E to the power pi. Which one is bigger? In this figure, this figure, this figure actually tells us that pi to the power E is strictly less than E to the power pi. Okay, we, we explain this figure. Okay. We are going to explain this figure. Okay. Here, actually, we consider uh, a curve uh, y, the function y equal to 1 by x. Okay. So, we are considering one curve uh, function f uh, from the, the domain of the function is open interval 0, infinity to r. Okay. So, this function. You know this function is uh, the uh, convex function. Okay. This is actually convex function. This is actually convex function. Yeah. And, and actually, we are, we are using this property. So, and also you know that uh, the E is strictly less than pi. Okay. E is strictly less than pi. Okay. So, just we draw the uh, graph of the function. This is a graph of the function, okay, and we take uh, uh, two points, uh, x equal to e and x equal to pi on x-axis, okay. Now, we, are, uh, we, we, are, we consider a rectangle. We, we consider this rectangle, okay, this rectangle. So, this is the rectangle we, we, we are considering, okay. Now, what is the area of this rectangle? Area of the rectangle. Rectangle area, what is the area of the rectangle? So, actually, the length is actually pi minus e. Okay. And the height of the rectangle is actually, this is, this is, this is actually point e. So, uh, this uh, height is actually 1 by e. Because we are considering the graph of the function 1 by x. Okay. So, this area is actually pi by e minus 1. Okay. Now, uh, we are considering the area of this curve, this this shaded region. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the actually, actually we are considering the area uh, between this region. Okay, so we are considering this area. Okay, this area. So you see that this curve is continuous on this uh, on this on this domain. Okay. Continuous. So obviously, this is a Riemann integral. So this thing actually exists, and 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 you know the geometric meaning of Riemann integral is nothing but the area. So we are using that concept. So so that that area is this. Okay, and so this is nothing but and the integration is log pi minus log e. That is actually one. Okay, and you see that uh, from this figure. This figure tells us that th that re uh, that area. Okay, is strictly less than the area covered by the Rectangle. Okay, the rectangular area is bigger area. Okay, just now you just simplify. So this is actually nothing but log pi is strictly less than pi by e, and this is nothing but so pi to the power e is strictly less than to the power pi. Okay, so this is the proof. Uh, proof. Okay, but uh, but uh, if you uh, look at that paper, that that uh, there that figure is sufficient uh, that. The pi to the power is strictly less than e to the power pi. Okay, and again, this is my other paper. Okay, and that paper is ex published in Mathematical Intelligence. Okay, this visualization is again a paper. Okay, of mine. Okay, next we demonstrate another uh, uh, another uh, another way to visualize pi to the power e is strictly less than e to the power pi. Okay. This is another way. Actually, I, I, uh, actually, uh, I, I am, I am, I want to, sh uh, want to focus that any, 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 any kind of result, any kind of ideas can be visualized in different uh, ways. Okay. So this is another ways. 
way to visualize that pi to the power e is strictly less than e to the power pi. Okay, so we explain this one. So look at this picture, uh, photo picture. So here we consider uh, the function y equal to log x. Okay, y equal to log x. Okay, and at the point x equal to one, we consider the tangent to the curve. Okay, so tan the, the equation of the tangent line is y equal to x minus one. Okay, so you have a curve y equal to log x, and at the point x equal to one, you consider the tangent. Y equal to x minus one. Okay, just a minute. Just so you consider what you consider. Consider the curve y equal to log x. Okay, and at that point, at x, just a minute. Uh, you, you you consider the tan. This is a tangent line. This is a tangent line, and the equation is y equal to x minus 1 okay or equal to x minus 1 okay now look e is strictly less than pi right so pi by e is strictly greater than 1 so you consider the tangent at the point x equal to 1 so obviously pi by e lies just right side of x equal to 1 okay now you consider a line Sorry, just to consider the line at the point x equal to 1, x equal to pi by e, okay. Just to consider this. So in, uh, okay. So, you consider uh, the line, line segment at, at the point x equal to pi by e, okay. So, you see this length qr, this length is actually log of pi by e, okay. So, you see that the length qr is actually log of pi by e, okay. And the length pr is actually pi by e minus 1. So, you see that pr is actually pi by e minus 1, okay. And from figure, figure you see that the length pr is bigger than the length qr okay so the length pr is bigger than the length qr so obviously pi by e minus 1 is bigger than log of pi by e that is actually log pi minus 1 just then simple calculation you can derive the inequality pi to the power e is strictly less than e to the power pi okay so here we, we are uh, considering uh, that uh, the, that y equal to x minus 1 is tangent at the point x equal to 1 to the curve y equal to log x. Okay. And this proof is actually given by my UG student Anando. Okay. Uh, when he when, uh, he was at a uh, first semester student. Okay. Just after taking admission in our college, once uh, one day he came to me and showed, sir, we can visualize this. Okay. And later it is, it, it, again, it published in a journal, uh, Mathematical Intelligence, sir. So this uh, this paper uh, this visualization uh, was given by Anando, my student. Okay. 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 Next, we uh, we are going to uh, visualize a more general inequality that a to the power b is bigger than b to the power a. When A and B are two real numbers, both are bigger than E and B is bigger than A. Okay. So, we are going to demonstrate this. this. And this is, this is the general settings, general uh, uh, general visualization. Because if you take A equal to E and B equal to pi, uh, then you get uh, the result E to the power pi, uh, the, the comparison between E to the power pi and pi to the power E. Okay. okay. So, we are going to uh, explain this figure. Okay. 
this is a more general result. Okay, so here again, here we consider the car y equal to log x. Again, we consider the car y equal to log x. Okay, so we consider the car y equal to log x. Fine. Now, it's, you know, this point is actually one, and you are considering two real numbers a and b such that. A is strictly less than B and A is greater or equal to E. Okay. This is figure. Okay. Now you uh, just uh, consider, just join this point. This is a line segment at the point X equal to A. This is the line segment at the point X equal to B. This is the line segment at the point X equal to E. Okay. Now you, you join uh, this point. Sorry. Uh, this point and this point, just, uh, just look at this uh, fig uh, figure. You, you just join this point and this point by a line segment. I mean, this point, uh, this point, and this point by a line segment. Okay, actually, uh, my, uh, my drawing is not uh, proper, that's why. Uh, if, uh, okay, just for that, just look this uh, this figure. Okay, and again, join this point and this point, uh, this point, and this point by, uh, by, uh, by another line segment. Okay, if you have two points. Uh, in plane, you must join by uh, by a line. Okay, so this is Euclid uh, uh, axiom. Okay, so yes, we can join this. Okay, so you join origin and that two points. Okay, so you see, so you see that these two, uh, these are the lines, uh, these are the lines passing through origin. Okay, so the uh, equation uh, of, of those uh, those lines looks like y equal to mx type. Okay, so we consider this equation as y equal to a may x and this equation as y equal to m b x. Okay. Now look this angle and this angle and this angle. Okay. So you see that this angle is bigger than this angle. Okay. So obviously tan, tan of this angle is bigger than tan of this angle, right? So, obviously, MA, MA is bigger than MB, right? Okay, MA is bigger than MB. So, what is MA? Uh, MA means, uh, this is actually log A, uh, this is actually log A by A, tangent means uh, uh, perpendicular this, uh, by base okay perpendicular by base so uh, log a by a is bigger than log b by b and then you just simplify it okay so you have the desired inequality okay and this inequality uh, uh, this result uh, this visualization was given by gallant charles gallant okay So this is a visualization to the famous inequality a to the power b is bigger than uh, b to the power a where a and b are two real numbers with that property. Okay. Okay. Next we are going to uh, visualize another famous inequality. You know e. Uh, the, uh, if I ask again, if I ask you give me some example of transcendental number. So the first I, 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 maybe the first example is e. And uh, you know that E lies between two real numbers, 2 and 3. Here, we give a visualization that E lies between 2 and 3. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, 
so if i if you if i ask you the defin what is the definition of e we can define e in two ways okay so uh, one is uh, by uh, uh, using series and another uh, one is using calculus okay so first we uh, define the log function uh, the definition of log function is in this way uh, log of x equal to dx uh, dt by t uh, uh, log of x equal to integration 1 to x dt by t. So, this is the definition of log function. And uh, what is the definition of e? e? E is defined e is defined as that e is a number for that that integral value that integral value is 1. So, this is the definition of e. Another def uh, one, one definition of e that e is a real number such that that integral value 1 to e is 1. Then that real number is called e. So, this is the definition of e. There is another definition uh, using series. Okay. Uh, uh, there, there is a sequence, you know, that xn equal to, if you consider the sequence xn equal to 1 plus 1 by factorial 1 plus 1 by factorial plus up to uh, 1 by factorial n, then you can show that this series is bounded above and uh, uh, amount of increasing. So, this series is convergent. So, that converging point is called E. This is another definition of E. So, here we, de uh, here we uh, define E in this way. Okay. And both two definitions are equivalent. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, actually, uh, 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 we are going to show that 2 less than E less than 3. So, this statement is equivalent to show that L2 is strictly less than 1, less strictly less than L3. Okay. So, actually we have uh, to show that L2 is strictly less than 1 and 1 is strictly less than L3. We have to show this. Okay. Now, what is L2? What is L2? L2 is this area. So, L2 is actually integration 1 to 2 dt by t, this area, the L2, and you just look at this square, look at this square, okay, this square, okay. So, what is the area of this square? Area of that square is, the length is actually, this length is actually, 2 minus 1, okay, and that height is actually 1, so that area is actually 1, okay. And from this figure, you can visualize that the area of this, rect this, this rectangle is bigger than L2, okay. So, obviously, L2 is strictly less than 1. That means 2 is strictly less than E. So, one part is done. So, this part, this figure, this portion actually uh, implies that uh, E is a number which is bigger than 2. Now, we are going to explain that L3 is bigger than 1, that is, E is strictly less than 3. So, we are going to explain that one. Now, think, uh, what is L3? Now, we are, uh, now, we are considering L3. What is L3? L3 is the area, integration 1, 2, 3, dt by t. Okay. So, L3 is this area. L3 is, uh, just, uh, this just look, this area. Okay. L3 is this area. Okay. L3 is this area. 
Okay. So we can think uh, L3 is this area. Now we uh, just we break this area into three parts. Okay. So for that we draw a line parallel to this line through this point. Okay. Just to join this. Okay. At the point x equal to two. At the point x equal, if, if if this is a point x equal to two, so obviously this point is actually the coordinate is two comma half. Okay, because this is the uh, graph of y equal to one by x. So uh, uh, at this point we draw a parallel line and parallel to this line. Okay, this is a line. Okay, so the, so the, look, the, what is the L three? So L three can be think as area of this portion plus area of this portion area of this portion and then area of this portion, just this portion, okay. This portion, okay. So this is actually L3, okay. This is actually L3. Now, now we consider the area of this rectangle, okay. This bigger rectangle. So this is actually L3 part. Now we consider the area of this bigger rectangle, this rectangle. Okay. Just consider this rectangle. So what is the area of this rectangle? See, the length is actually, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. So length is actually 3 minus 1. Okay. And the height is actually half. It is actually half. So this is area is actually one. Okay. Now this area can we think as a sum of three portions. This portion. Okay. Plus. Plus this portion, this portion, and this portion can be written as just think on this portion, this portion, okay, plus this portion, okay. So uh, we can think the bigger uh, area of the bigger rectangle is as sum of this three portion and L3 as sum of this three portion. Okay. Now just we compare those areas. See L3 and this rectangle has this area common. This area common. Okay. And now, uh, now uh, just a minute. Okay. And L3 has another portion, this portion. L3 has another portion, this portion. This is this portion, okay. And that area has again that portion. Okay. So these two area has two common portion. This one is same as this one. This one is same as this one. So in L3, this one is left. And in the uh, area of a rectangle, this one is left. Okay. Now... What we did here, we just, we rotate this portion, 
by 180 degree angle, by 180 degree angles, okay. Just we take the re reflection, we take the reflection about this line, line okay. That is actually we uh, give a rotation, this lines, uh, this curve by 180 degree, okay. So you get this line, okay. Now look, this area, this area is same as this area, okay. So this area is same as this area. So naturally, naturally, you see that this area is strictly less than this area. You can visualize it uh, if you give a rotation, uh, this portion by 180 degree, okay. So here you see that this area is bigger than, this is bigger than this portion, okay. So L3 has three portion, one, two, three, and that, that area has three portion. And among them, these two portions are same, only these two areas are left. And if you compare by giving a rotation, you see that this area is bigger than this area, okay. So obviously from this, explanation you can say that L3 is bigger than area of this rectangle okay and area of this rectangle is actually 1 so L3 is bigger than 1 that means 3 is bigger than E so E must be so E is strictly less than 3 so that is the inequality 2 less than E less than 3 okay and this is a nice and beautiful visualization that E lies between 2 and 3 okay and this visualization is given by Nick Lord. Okay. Okay. Now we will present some elegant visual demonstration of some results related to limits. Okay, we, uh, we learned uh, some limit results uh, in our 12th standard class or in class here we give two visual uh, proof of uh, uh, known results two known results okay first we establish that the harmonic series is divergent okay so this figure actually this figure demonstrate that the harmonic series is divergent and we, we will explain it Okay. Okay. So for that, again, we consider the uh, graph of the function y equal to 1 by x. Uh, uh, y equal, we consider the function, this function, where f of x is given by 1 by x. Okay. And this, uh, this function is convex function. Okay. And we know that harmonic series is actually, what is harmonic series? What is harmonic series? This is sum of this actually. Okay, uh, one plus half plus one third plus one fourth plus onwards. So this sum actually plus infinity. That means this does not converge. That means that sum is bigger than any given real numbers. Okay, we have established by this figure. Okay, for that, uh, just uh, we consider the points uh, on x-axis. This is a point x equal to 1. Then we consider the point x equal to 2, x equal to 3, x equal to 4, and la lastly x equal to n, and then n plus 1. And this is a curve, a graph of the function y equal to 1 by x. Okay. Now, we consider this rectangle. Actually, this figure is uh, very much similar uh, to Riemann sum. If you uh, think uh, Riemann sum, then this is actually similar to that. Okay. So, uh, then we consider a line segment at the point x equal to 1, then x equal to 2, x equal to 3, x equal to 4, lastly x equal to n, then x equal to n plus 1. Okay. And we draw rectangles in this way, right. Okay. 
So now, what is the area of this rectangle? The area of this rectangle is the length is actually one. Okay, and the high, uh, the base is actually two minus one. That is one. Okay. Then, what is the area of this rectangle? The height is actually half. And the base is actually three minus two. That is one. That is one. That is one. Okay. And similarly, area of this this thing is actually one third. Okay. And area of this thing is actually one by n. Okay. So area of all those rectangle is this sum. So this is actually one plus half plus one third plus one by n. So this is actually area of all those rectangles okay now we consider the area bounded by the curve y equal to 1 by x we consider this area okay area bounded by the curve y equal to 1 by x x axis and x equal to 1 x equal to n plus 1 okay so we are considering the area this area so this area is actually this thing okay and what is this area this is actually log of n plus 1 minus log 1 that is 0 okay this area now from this figure you see that the area of those rectangles is bigger than the area bounded by the curve y equal to 1 by x x axis and x equal to 1 and x equal to n plus 1 okay so so this figure tells us that this sum is bigger than log of n plus 1 okay and you know that log x is strictly increasing function okay so this quantity goes to infinity as n goes to infinity so obviously this quantity cannot be can't be can't be converged can't, can't, can't converge okay so obviously the sum of, of these numbers is plus infinity okay so harmonics is diverges and this figure and this figure tells us that result okay and this is very familiar result if you google it you can find this picture okay this is very famous okay thing okay so next Next, we establish another thing that the limit of this function, limit of 1 plus 1 by n whole to the power n as n tends to infinity is e. Okay. And this is the last visualization. Already we have reached our time. So this one is the last one. Okay. Okay, so again here we actually uh, actually uh, the car uh, that the function f uh, from open interval zero to infinity to r defined by f x equal to one by x. This curve is very beautiful curve. Uh, that curve has a uh, one property that is this is convex. Okay, using this property we can give lot of visualizations. There are a lot of visualizations using this curve. Okay, and you see that uh, uh, today we explained uh, many results using this curve okay so this curve is very beautiful okay so again we consider the graph graph of the function y equal to 1 by x okay now we consider the point x equal to 1 and then we consider the point x equal to 1 plus 1 by n okay Now we consider a rectangle by this way. So, what is the area of this rectangle? The area of this the area of this rectangle is the length is that length is one, okay, and the length of the base is actually one by n. You see it, okay. Now, what is the area of this 
bounded region bounded by the curve y equal to 1 by x, x axis and x equal to 1 and x equal to 1 plus 1 by n. What is the area? That area is actually integration 1 to 1 plus 1 by n dt by t. Okay. And you see from this figure that the area of the rectangle is bigger than the area covered by the curve y equal to 1 by x and x axis and x equal to 1 and x equal to 1 plus 1 by n. Okay. Now, we consider, we join this point such that this line segment is parallel to this line segment. Okay. So, now what is the area of this portion? Area of this portion, so the length of this portion is actually 1 by 1 plus 1 by n and this length is actually 1 by n. And from this figure, you see that this is actually strictly less than this integration. Okay. Now, we ju you just simplify it. So, if you simplify it, so you have just simplify it n by n plus 1 multiplied by 1 by n and strictly less than this is actually log of 1 plus 1 by n and this is strictly less than 1 by n. So, that is actually n by n plus 1 is strictly less than log of 1 plus 1 by n whole to the power n strictly less than 1. Now, you just take the limit or we apply sandwich theorem. So, so limit of log log of 1 plus 1 by n whole to the power n equal to 1 as n tends to infinity and that means since log is continuous function you know expo and exponential function is con uh, continuous functions. So, so obviously this is this goes to e. Okay. So, this is another visualization that limit of this function is e. Okay, and I uh, I stop here. Actually, uh, actually, visual proofs. Uh, we say this is a visual proof, but many times it needs some words to explain. Okay, so uh, all times it is not actually proof without words. Many times it needs words. Okay, so if uh, if uh, if undergraduate students can uh, if if they want they can uh, uh, they can do this kind of mathematics uh, when they have recess time. Okay. And uh, this is the references. Uh, uh, there are some papers of mine. This is uh, my papers, and uh, this is the papers of uh, other writers. And this is a this is a uh, book uh, uh, written by Roger B. Nielsen, Proof Without Words. Okay, this book is published by Mathematical Association of America. So this uh, in that book you have lot lots of visual proofs. Okay, and the same author has another book. That's uh, part two of that uh, book. That is published in 2000. Uh, that is uh, again proof without words, part two. And in 2015, he wrote a third part of that book. This is again proof without words. So those are the uh, good books if someone wants to see visual proofs or proof without words. Okay, thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Dr. Chakraborty, for your wonderful, enlightening speech. Okay. It's an excellent session, and I hope this will surely enhance the motivational aspect of studying mathematics, particularly uh, to our UG and PG students. Okay. Now, it is the time to take questions. Audience in YouTube and Google Meet are requested to type their questions in the chat box and uh, some are already there. Uh, in particular, Subhash Mondol, Subhash Mondol questions that uh, in your consideration all numbers are positive. What happens if some numbers are negative? Okay. Actually, see, actually, we are uh, uh, the, the arguments we used here that is actually length of straight line or area of, of, a, uh, of a bounded region. Okay. So, you know that, uh, that area cannot be negative in usual sense. Okay. So, yeah. that's why we can't take uh, negative numbers. <laughs> Obvious. And the next one by Nirvik Masanto uh, in AM greater equals GM proof you say that the middle part has positive area. Is there any idea about negative area? 
EDS, how you establish this fact? Okay, just a minute. Let me explain. Let us take two real numbers. One is A and another is B. Okay. So your question is what about the negative area? Okay. First of all, I already uh, said that uh, uh, we are considering the, the, uh, the idea that area of a unit square is 1. Okay. And I, I already said that this is, this is an axiom. You can't prove this. This is an axiom. If you uh, go through the definition of area, there are several axioms. So this this one this one is one of them. The area is positive, and using this, if A is positive, and if A is positive and B is positive, using this idea, you can prove that the area of a rectangle is AB. Okay, you can prove it. Okay, so here in our in our discussion, we always take A is positive and B is positive. Now your question, your question is what about this area? Is that area, what about that area? Okay, so if we take any two real numbers, A and B, you know there, are, there is another axiom. Uh, if, we st if you start to learn real number system, so first we state what is order axiom. Okay, so there is a starting point of real analysis is order, uh, first is a field axiom, then order axiom. So in order axiom, there is law of trichotomy. So if you have two real number, A and B, then you can always, uh, there, uh, there is axiom. By that axiom, you can say that either A is bigger than B or A is equal to B or B is bigger than A. Okay. So since A and B are arbitrary real numbers, so this case is same as this case. Okay. Because if B is bigger than A, then we consider B first than A. So we don't consider this one. Okay, so uh, so uh, since A and B are two positive real numbers, so there are two possibilities. Either A is bigger than B or A equal to B and this follows from law of trichotomy. Okay, so if A is bigger than B, then, then this figure is fine. Okay, and you see, so there is a positive area. Okay, and what happens if A equal to B? Just to uh, draw the picture, if A equal to B, so this is actually nothing but maybe uh, uh, this kind of separation. So, so there is no area. So that area is actually zero area. So that's why that's why uh, that equality came. Uh, Am get out equal to Gm. That why this kind of equality came. Uh, you know, if you go through the uh, usual proof, uh, weighted Am get out equal to weighted Gm in that kind of things, then that kind of equality occurs if that vector is linearly dependent. Uh, uh, like, like like that, okay. So this kind of ordered pair is uh, some lambda times of that kind. So that means here A is one times of B. That's why, uh, that's why equality comes actually. And uh, in that case, that area is actually zero. And uh, if and if B is greater than A, then you just uh, take this is A and this is B. Okay, just, just uh, uh, actually this is actually commutative like that. Okay. Okay, next one from Oyon Das. Uh, Oyon, are you there, Oyon? Are you listening, Oyon? Oyon, are you listening me? Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, um, uh, I find your question. Your how one plus half plus one third plus up to. Uh, Dot dot infinity. infinity. I hope you got your answer. <laughs> you have already got yes, <laughs> it. Yes, yes, okay, okay. I don't refer it to Vikash. Okay, thanks. Okay, sir. Okay. Um, thanks, Vikash. Uh, there are a flood of a flood of accomplishments in YouTube <laughs> about your lecture, and we hope so. Okay, a very 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 interesting session, and okay, thanks. Um, now, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to request Mr. Uh, sorry, Dr. Sushil Kumar Ghosh to deliver the vote of thanks. Sir, please. Uh, now, we came to the end of this today's seminar. 
Now it is a vote of thanks, it is a part of this seminar. Now, Honorable Principal of Gorbeta College, Dr. Hori Prasad Sarkar, Prof. Madhu Mangal Pal, Prof. Sujit Kumar Sardar, Prof. Sourav Das, Prof. Vikas Chakraborty, the participants of the webinar coming from various colleges, faculty members of our department, students, ladies and gentlemen. It is my privilege to propose the vote of thanks in this webinar. In the enrichment program for students and teachers, this is first phase on linear algebra, analysis, and differential equations. I take this opportunity to express our profuse gratitude and sincere thanks to the principal of Gorbeta College for his esteemed presence among us and presiding over the function. The valuable thoughts he has expressed on this occasion will no doubt serve our college in footstep to proceed further in the direction of development in teaching and research. Thank you, sir, for your encouragement and sagacious advice and guidance. We promise never to forget the keynote speech of Professor Mudumangal Pal, Professor in Mathematics with the University. I also feel proud to have him as a keynote speaker in this webinar. His benchmark lecture inspires us to put our thought in the series of resourceful and illuminating discourses under the webinar. In addition, I will also entrust our students to research in algebra and analysis. I pay my, my heartiest thanks to Professor Pal for his innovative lecture. Thank you, Professor Pal. Lecture presented by Professor Sujit Kumar Sardar, Professor in Mathematics, Jadavpu University, has really touched the heights and fulfilled the aim we envisaged. On behalf of the department, I convey my gratitude and heartfelt thanks to Professor Sardar for accepting our invitation and consenting to deliver webinar talk. His erudite talk on the topic illuminates various directions of the subject. Thank you, sir, for your gracious presence and wonderful delivery of speech in this webinar. I deeply indebted to Dr. Saurabh Das, Assistant Professor in Mathematics, NIT Jamshedpur, for his kind spare of time for Gorbeta College webinar. His painstaking exposition and annotation reroute the subject topic on orthogonal polynomial to a comprehensive position. Many thanks to Dr. Das for his enlightening presentation that makes the subject matter easily grasped. We are happy to mention our obligation to Dr. Vikas Chakravati, Assistant Professor in Mathematics, Rahora Ramkrishna Mission Centenary College, Rahora, for accepting our invitation and delivering his lecture today. His attractive deliberation deserves appreciation of excellence in teaching and research in the context of subject mathematics for visualization of mathematics in geometry and visualization processes. Let me express my gratitude and thanks to Dr. Chakravarti for his lecture. I put forward my special thanks to all the distinguished dignitaries in the audience who spare their valuable time and be with us in the two-day seminar. I would also thanks to President GB of the college and its members, coordinator of IQAC, various college committee conveners and its members who are directly or indirectly extended their support and inspiration to organize the webinar. I take the opportunity to thanks to participants, professor, esteemed dignitaries and students for their presence and participation in the interactive session. Our kind of words and appreciation also go to my colleagues, Dr. Obhijit Banerjee and Dr. Rajalokhi Mukherjee for their tireless effort to organize this webinar. I offer my sincere gratitude and thanks to all the departmental teachers of mathematics departments and staff, also to the faculty of Gorbeta College and staff. Finally, I thank you your continued support and encouragement to march forward in our place for
थैंक यू सर थैंक यू थैंक्स ऑल ऑफ यू वन सेकेंड थैंक्स आई वुड लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर राजलोकी मुखर्जी टू एंड दिस डिक्लेयर द एंड ऑफ दिस सेशन राजलोकी हेलो हेलो राजलोकी आर यू दियर so he is not there i would like to request dr banerji to declare the end of the session thank you sir okay um, this is the uh, this is the end of today's and uh, total webinar session okay and stay alive and um, okay so this is the end of the webinar thank you thank you everyone to be our with us okay thank you sir